day and welcome to our online message for this week. My name is Deanna Carter and I serve as the pastor of Margaretsville and Lower Granville Baptist Churches. Today we are looking at James 3 verses 1 to 12 and it's a sermon on the tongue. <laughs> so stay tuned, it's going to be interesting. I want you to remember back to when you were a child and I ask you do any of you remember sticking your tongue out at someone? Maybe a friend made you upset and you were just so angry that you were going to show them and out goes that tongue. <laughs> that was so powerful. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't see this happening much today. But then again, I'm not around children as much now as I used to be. And I haven't witnessed any adults sticking their tongues out at one another, um, which is good. But I think that you will agree that as we get older and we mature, instead of, I think, I hope we mature, instead of sticking out our tongues, we have the tendency to move them up and down and formulate words to express how we're feeling. And we use these words to get at people. We can gossip about people. We can slander people. We can hurt people really bad with our words. Well, in his practical book, James has been, been telling us how we are to live as believers in this world. And back in chapters 1 and 2, he looked at how the believer is to handle trials how, how we are to be hearers, not only hearers, but doers of the word, and how genuine faith shows no favoritism, and it always results in good deeds. And if it doesn't, well, then it's dead. Today in chapter 3, we see James continues to address how we are to live in this world, and he talks quite a bit about that small, powerful part of everyone's body, the tongue. Now, I don't know about you, but this passage of scripture stops me in my tracks because James very clearly says that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Back in the day when, when James was writing, teaching was highly valued and a respected profession especially in the Jewish culture. And many Jews who became Christians wanted to become teachers like James. This was good, but, but James warned them that teachers have great responsibility because their words and their example affect others' spiritual lives. Being a teacher, aka a, a pastor or a, a group leader or a Sunday school teacher, a Bible study leader, any position uh, where you are leading and teaching others is one of great responsibility. And it's not to be taken lightly. As spiritual teachers, we deal with matters of eternal life and death. And this is serious stuff. Knowing what to say and what not to say, when to say it or when not to say it, when to be quiet, uh, delivering the correct information, not abusing the position or distorting the message or, or leading anyone astray, living what we preach and being an example. All this could cause one to run away from being a pastor or a teacher, couldn't it? James is telling them and us that it's, it's not something you do because you want to be popular. It's a serious calling and God must lead you there. I do find comfort in the next verse when James says, we all stumble in many ways. And he includes himself in that as well. He says, we. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect or mature, able to keep their whole body in check. And of course, we know the only one who is perfect was Jesus. But we are all called to grow in our faith. And as we do, 
we will stumble along the way, but we continue trying. We continue to rely upon him for help. How many times do, do we say the wrong thing and then think, why did I say that? And we can't take it back, can we? Have you ever done this? I'm sure, I'm sure we all have. Words come so quickly before the, the double gate of our teeth and our lips can keep them in. They're out there with all of their power. Power that will hurt or power that will heal, negative or positive. A wise man once said, I have often regretted my speech, never my silence. Perhaps we need to consider that at times. James says that if we can control our tongues, um, James says if we can control our tongues, then we'll be able to control our bodies. But we all stumble. Now, this isn't a way out. It's, it's not a reason um, that we can stop trying. We have to continue to answer God's calling. We must seek his help. We must allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. We are, as it says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, it says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, in this letter, James is addressing believers in general. He's not talking to a specific church or a specific leadership. So we're led to conclude that all believers are to follow this advice. We all have a tongue and we all use that tongue every day. Some of us more than others, right? But as believers, we are all called to share the gospel and to, to teach the ways of the Lord by our words and our actions. So let me ask you this question. Are, are you always mindful of the impact that your words can have on those around you? Unfortunately, if you're like me, I think the answer is no. Because we are not always slow to speak, are we? And as a result, sometimes those powerful words, they just flow out before we can think. And they have effect. The childhood saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That isn't true. Words are powerful. As we keep reading, we see James uses some metaphors to describe the power of the tongue, the power of words. In verse 3 and 4, he says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Our tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth or the small rudder of a ship. It is small compared to the body, but it has power over the body. The bit in the mouth of the horse, it enables the, the rider to control this large animal, doesn't it? They can make it go wherever they desire. And the horse yields to the rider. Or think of a big ship. A small thing like a rudder can steer that big vessel. The pilot can direct the ship by controlling the rudder. In both cases, we see something very small directing and controlling something much bigger. Think about that. Our little wagging tongues, though small, they possess immense power. With the tongue, we influence and we shape our lives and the lives of others. Well, as we keep reading, we see James next. He asks us to consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Those are James's words. You know, there's a, a another children's chorus, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Well, we have watched as recent as this past summer, how a small spark can cause such damage as it turns into a raging forest fire. Some people lost everything this summer. And just as a spark can set the forest afire, so too can a careless word lead to destruction and chaos for people. Families, communities, churches, it happens everywhere. Those, those casual, sarcastic or critical remarks, they can inflict a lasting injury on another person. Just as that well-timed encouragement or compliment can inspire someone for the rest of their life. I bet you can remember individuals in your life who have inspired you with their words. And when you recall them, a smile comes to your face. A feeling of happiness. On the other hand, perhaps you can also recall someone who hurt you terribly with their words. And to this day, you have not forgotten the negative impact that they had on you. Words are powerful. And we should never underestimate the influence of our words, whether they're written or spoken. They have power that can build people up or tear them down. Idle and hateful words can also spread destruction, like the spark, like the fire that once they're said, they can't be taken back. We can say, I'm sorry, but I'm sure you'll agree a few words spoken in anger, they can ruin a relationship. As followers of Christ, we are to be careful with our words and speak words of love and encouragement and truth. We have to, to guard against being part of gossip and slander and hateful hateful speech about and to others. Look at verses seven and eight. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. What hope do we have? He says, no human being can tame the tongue. Should we just give up on this, this poisonous part of our body? This restless evil, as James puts it? Let's keep reading. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt spring produce fresh water. Very clearly, James is telling us it just doesn't make sense. If we who are believers and are following Christ are blessing God with one breath, and then cursing our neighbors with the other, then it's like salt water and fresh water coming from the same spring or olives coming from a fig tree. It shouldn't happen. Because when we curse others, we are cursing God who has made us in his image. And this is not right. And this is not the example that we want to show others. Joanne Taylor says it's been said that the, the number one criticism of the church by young adults these days is the charge of hypocrisy. Growing number of people between the ages of 18 and 35 find the faith language of Christians to be hollow and empty. 
because they hear the kind of language we use when we aren't in church and it doesn't match. You see, our words and our deeds in the church are to be the same as our words and deeds outside the church. We don't act one way in one place and another way in the other place. The story's been told of a pastor who was doing some business with someone and this person was just cussing up a storm. And then he asked him, the pastor, what he did for a living. And the man said, I'm a pastor. Well, the cussing man immediately said, oh, I'm a Christian too, really? <laughs> our words reveal our heart and who we really are. Are we the same in all situations and with all people? And you know, we have to look at, at all aspects of our actions because it's not just swearing. It could be the way we, we sometimes put other people down. It could be gossiping about our friends, things that we don't know if they're true or not, but we're gonna pass it on. What about failing to show kindness? being critical of others, and the list goes on and on. You get the idea. Our tongue is not to be praising God and then speaking words that are not appropriate. Our tongues, our words are not to be inconsistent. Our speech should always be glorifying God. We shouldn't use one vocabulary or one tone of speaking at church and then a different one when we're at home or at work. Like the spring of water, James says our mouths shouldn't send forth fresh and bitter from the same opening. But let's go back to verse two where James says, we all stumble. And yes, we do. However, this isn't an excuse to stop trying. Someone has said it's better to try and put out one fire than to go around setting new ones. So what do we do? Well, I think we need to acknowledge the challenge. It's difficult to, to control our speech 100% of the time, but we also must realize that our words, they can cause destruction and chaos for ourselves. For others. I presented this to you before and I do so again today as a challenge and that is before you say anything ask yourself is what I'm going to say is it true is it kind is it necessary and is it helpful if the answer is no to any of these then keep quiet a lot of times I also wonder if Jesus was physically present in our gatherings, would we act the same way? Would we say the same things or would we behave differently? In our own strength, we cannot tame the tongue. But praise be to God that we do not have to rely only on ourselves and our strength. Yes, awareness and self-discipline and determination all play a big part. But when we ask the Holy Spirit who's living inside of us to help us, to make us aware, he will give us the strength we need and he will change our heart because it's from our heart that our words flow. And if the Spirit is controlling us, then our speech will be true. It will be kind, it will be necessary, it will be helpful. So as you and I go forward, let's continue to, to dedicate our lives to God. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to, to tame our tongues. Let's practice being slow to speak, slow. And before we say anything, let's pause and think about what we're saying. Let's be careful to use our tongues to praise and to worship, to bless others, to build them up, not tear them down. 
May we echo the psalmist's prayer. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Psalm 141, verse 3. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in his sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thanks for joining with me once again. I pray God's blessing upon you this week and may you be a blessing to others. Take care. See you next time.